Good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. If you guys want to make your way into the sanctuary so we can go into a time of worship, you want to stand to your feet. I know it's a rainy day, so we're just still strolling on in, but that's okay, right? We're just going to start this day off with some worship to the Lord. Oh, Father, we bless you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just begin to just thank God this morning? Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you this morning, Father. Lord, we give you praise this morning, Jesus. You are so worthy, Lord. God, we just exalt you in this place, Lord. We lay everything down at your feet this morning, Jesus. Lord, no matter what we came in here with this morning, God, we give it to you, Lord. Oh, Father, we say you can have it, Lord. You can have it all, Father. You can take it, Lord. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Thank you. Oh, just begin to bless them. Just begin to bless them this morning, church. And whatever what that way looks for you, just begin to bless them. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We open up our mouth this morning and we give you praise. Worship you, Lord. Can we just wait on him this morning, church? Can we just wait on him this morning? Can we bless him as we wait on him this morning? Can we do that this morning? Oh, we wait on you, Lord. Yes, we do. We wait on you, Lord. We wait on you, Lord. We wait on you, Lord. Oh, we bless you. 
that this morning. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For in this case, we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God.
atonement for us to, to the son who overcame all the power of death we praise for the stripes for the wounds for the beating you bore for the tears for the blood that was willingly poured for the merciful wonderful majesty of your love Yeah. 
this is an appropriate time to take communion Jesus said to do it often in remembrance of him so I'm going to encourage you to come up and grab an element for yourself or if you're grabbing for somebody else go ahead and do that as well but in this attitude of worship would you just come up and grab what you need for your family or for yourself important that we do this often to remember and we're going through a season of Christmas right and sometimes you'll see signs that say Jesus is the reason for the season amen I always like to read this part first this is out of 1st Corinthians chapter 11 it says this therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to 
examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. You know, the context of this is the first Corinthians were running amok and they're they were doing the Lord's Supper and, and like in a selfish way, but I like to apply it uh, to our hearts. You know, as we're as we're coming before the Lord, we know that by His grace and by His mercy, we find salvation and we find forgiveness for our sins. And I think it's always a a great time for us just to check our hearts. You know, like may there be anything in our hearts that that God needs to cleanse, or that we need repentance, or we need to repent, or we need forgiveness for. Let's just take a moment and, and reflect and have a personal moment with the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, you, you died for us. We were enemies of God before we became Christians. We were enemies of God before we were saved by your blood. And we thank you that you have cleansed us and washed us clean. We com commemorate that, we honor that, we celebrate that. What an amazing thing to be completely helpless completely unable to achieve a goal and you stepped in and made a way for us. Wonderful. So Paul writes this, for I received from the Lord. Hold on, I'm still working on my little plastic thing here. <laughs> for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. Thank you, Jesus. Can we continue to sing and worship our Lord? For the thing I've made it when it 
It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, this wedding ring that I wear, it's a symbol of being married. And when we get baptized, it's a symbol, it's a symbolic gesture of what's going on inside our heart. And that's how I see our worship time, our Singing of songs time. It's an outward expression of an inward relationship. And worship is more than just music. It's a way of life. It's how we live our lives. Everything we do is to be an act of worship. And if we're following Him, if we're keeping our eyes fixed on Him and we're seeing what the Father is doing, seeing what Jesus is doing, and we do likewise, that's worship. We follow we follow in, 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 in their lead, in, the, in the, the Father's lead, the Son's lead, and the Spirit's lead. And we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. I just thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us, oh God. You know, in this moment, I just want to ask if there's anyone who has a prayer need, that they might want us to lay hands on them and pray for them, whether it's a physical need a spiritual need, an emotional need, a, a mental need, a financial need, a relational need. 
You don't even have to tell us what it is because God knows your situation, amen. We're a praying church, amen. We're a believing church, amen. So if you'd like to come up and thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Can you just say thank you to the Lord? Just say thank you. Just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. We just thank you for any time we can have with you, any time we're made aware of your presence, any time we're able to draw near to you and experience you drawing near to us, oh God. I pray for your anointing. I pray for you to soften our hearts. I pray for your spirit to be apparent to us, oh God. I pray for the kids' church, oh God, as they go back. I ask that you'd anoint Rico and fill our kids Fill them with your spirit. Fill them with your love. Help them to know how much they are loved by you. You know, there's a lot of lies out there. The enemy is a liar, and the society can fill our kids' heads and even our heads, our hearts with lies. And I just rebuke the lies of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Help our children here at Real Life Church to know how much they're loved by their parents and, and by you, Lord. Help us all. Fill us all with your perfect love and cast out any kind of fear and anxiety, O oh Lord. Oh, help us to look to you. Help us to look to you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You know, stay tuned. We're going to do the uh, announcements at the end of service. Give you guys some, some, some instructions. I just didn't want to interrupt this moment that we're having here with the Lord. Uh, we have a message entitled today, He Must Increase. He must increase. What does that mean? That means we have to decrease. That's right. So we're celebrating Christmas season, and there's a lot of talk about the baby Jesus and Jesus being born and a, a foretelling of a king being born. We talked about that last week. Today we're going to kind of go off on a, on a kind of a side story about another baby that was promised, John the Baptist. And how that story is interwoven into the Christmas story. It's really quite amazing. We're going to start in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. If you want to follow along your Bibles, we'll have the, um, the verses on the screen there as well. Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. What does that tell us? They both come from the line of Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest of Israel. He was also a Levite or part of the Levi tribe. And so these two, both of them married each other within the, the, the tribe of Levi and Zechariah is in the, the line of, the, of the, the priestly line from Aaron, which is amazing. And it says in verse 6, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Wouldn't that be amazing if that would be our reputation, right? As individuals, you're like, man, that person follows the Lord blamelessly. Now listen, this is not saying that they were without sin, this is not saying that they didn't make mistakes, but their reputation, they were known for following God blamelessly. Woo, come on now. Now that's something to get excited about. Like that's a good goal, right? Like, like having a reputation where people, they say, oh, that person, man, they're a prayer warrior. Man, that person reads the word. Man, that person follows God blamelessly, Amen. Verse 7, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Now back in the Old Testament, I mean uh, uh, the ancient world and the Old Testament times, but back in the ancient world, man, being barren and not having children, that was no bueno. Like, like people really wanted to make sure that their line continued on. And so this was not a good thing for them. This is not an easy thing for them. Something that was very much on their heart, but they're very old at this time. Imagine praying for something for a long, long time, like really, really wanting something. Verse 8, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, 
He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So he's part of the priestly line. He's, he's a priest. And they would cast lots to decide who gets to go in and do the various duties of the priests in the temple. And the lot found on him, a lot would be like kind of like a, I don't know, rolling the dice or some kind of dominoes or something like that. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was a, it was a thing of chance. And I read somewhere that this might have been, possibly could have been his only time getting a chance to do this. Or maybe one of the few times that he got to do this. And it's amazing that he has an encounter with an angel of the Lord at this time. God, my wife always says that there's no coincidences. At this particular time, he has a visit from an angel when it's his turn to burn the incense. Matter of fact, here's a quote from BibleRap.com. Twice a day, a priest would offer incense there in the temple. In the New Testament era, it seems the honor of performing this rite was assigned by chance. And so what an what a amazing opportunity. It's almost like a priestly lottery. You know what I'm saying? Like He's like been waiting for this opportunity, and the lot fell on him. He's like, man, this is my big deal. And so he's getting his, getting his ephod or whatever. I don't know what he's wearing exactly. He gets his, his priestly garment going and stuff, and he's getting excited. And you know, maybe Elizabeth is, is excited as well. Verse 10 and when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So here's some explanation about that. Again, from BibleRef.com. To make this offering, Zechariah would have been alone in between curtains separating the courtyard from the holy place and the curtain which covered the most holy place. As he burnt the incense, the people would be outside in the courtyard praying. So he's all by himself doing this lighting of the incense. Verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Whoa! When Zacharias saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Can you imagine? You're supposed to be in there all by yourself, and all of a sudden there's this angelic being that appears before you. And it seems like every time an angel appears before someone, there's always fear involved. Because heaven is meeting earth. There's, an, there's a heavenly being in your presence, but he was supposed to be all alone in, the, in this place where the incense is being burned. All of a sudden, an angel appears before him, and it says he was startled. He was gripped with fear. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Listen, your prayer has been heard. Remember just a little bit ago, a few weeks ago, we talked about how the Lord hears the Lord hears. Think about every night, every day, wherever you are in your car, the Lord hears your whispers. The Lord hears your heart. The Lord is listening attentively to you every single moment. Anytime you utter something, he already knew that you were going to utter that. He already knew what was in your heart. He already knows what your needs are, and he hears every single prayer. And it says, don't be afraid. Listen, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Wonderful. The angel continued, he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Wow. This is an amazing declaration. This is a, a, an amazing prophecy, if you will. The angel is telling him what's going to happen, that this baby, even before he's born, is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. And I don't have a slide for this, Daryl, but in Luke 7, 28, Jesus says this, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. There was something special about this baby, about this child, about this Man, when he grew up, there was something very, very special about him. And again, this is interwoven into the Christmas story. John's born like maybe uh, several months or up to a year before Jesus was born. But Jesus did say, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. But he does say this, Jesus said this, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Just a little... 
even as great as John was, obviously Jesus was greater than he. No matter how great someone might be on this earth, no matter how anointed they might be or how blessed they might be or, or how loved they might be, they're not better than Jesus. Amen? Verse 16, the angel continued, He, listen, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Wow, wouldn't that be amazing again if that was said about us? That we were known for bringing people back to God. That we were known for bringing people to God. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Again, he's just, he's talking about John the Baptist before he's even born. Verse 17, the angel continued, and he will go before the Lord. That's important to know. He will go before the Lord in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Listen, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So those two lines are really important. He will go on before the Lord. He'll go on ahead of Jesus. He'll go on ahead of the Lord to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's really important. And you know, I thought about John the Baptist over the years. I have empathy for him. I, I, I do. His entire existence, his entire purpose was to point to Jesus, was to make a way for Jesus. And I have to tell you, I don't know if it's the flesh in me or, or just being empathetic, like, like, he didn't live very long, and his entire purpose was to point to Jesus. But here's the funny thing. Isn't that our entire purpose? Isn't that our entire purpose? To point people to Jesus. Like when someone comes up and says, hey, how'd you overcome that addiction? Ah, it wasn't me. It was Jesus. Hey, hey, why, why you got that joy about you? Uh, it's not me. I mean, telling you, I, I'm negative normally, but, but I, I got the joy of the Lord. What is different about you? Why are you so special? Well, it's all Jesus. He will go on before the Lord to make ready a people before the Lord. So number one thing about John the Baptist, he was called. What's amazing is he was called before he was even born, and I believe that there's a room full of people here that were called before they were even born. When you become a Christian, you are called. You are called to point people to Jesus. So John the Baptist is going to get the people ready for Jesus. And I, I kind of, I don't know, I, I was trying to think of the right phrase for this, but it, it, it reminds me of someone who softens up the crowd. You know what I mean? It's the opening act. You know what I mean? Someone, someone comes up, they're the opening act, and they're, they're, they're softening up the crowd. You know, you're getting the crowd ready, you know, getting the, the crowd stimulated. And by the time Jesus comes on the scene, they're ready. That was John's purpose, was to, was to make the way for Jesus. And after receiving news about being the mother of Jesus, Mary went to visit Elizabeth. And here's the thing, Mary and Elizabeth are relatives. We don't know exactly what kind of relative they were. It's interesting, if you follow the line of, of Mary and Joseph, you'll, you'll get to Judah. If you follow the line of, of Elizabeth and Zechariah, you'll get to Levi. So they are related in terms of being Hebrews, and they're definitely, it says that they were relatives. We don't know if they were cousins or what exactly, but Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. Let's pick it up in verse 41 of Luke chapter 1. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So not only was John filled with the Holy Spirit inside her, but Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, I don't, I'm assuming perhaps that Jesus was already conceived in Mary. And so when their, when their wombs touched or they were in proximity, there was a supernatural thing that took place. Beautiful, wonderful. You got John the Baptist inside Elizabeth and you got, you got Jesus brewing inside Mary, right? And there's this connection and not only is John the Baptist filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And she begins to exclaim, it says, she says, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, she didn't go, hey, Mary, guess what? She said it in a loud voice, in a loud voice, blessed are you among women. 
And blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Verse 44, Elizabeth continued, As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. There is a baby inside leaping with joy, which means that has to be supernatural. That has to be heavenly. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. What promises have, has God given to you? Do you believe that he will fulfill those promises? What are they? Think about it. Blessed are those who believe the Lord will fulfill his promises. Later on, after John the Baptist was born, we see in verse 65, all the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. There's like, there's, people are talking about it. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? They're not sure. Listen, for the Lord's hand was with him. What is this child going to be? What then is this child going to be? They, they weren't sure. Let's fast forward to when John grows up, becomes a man, becomes an adult, we're going to see this in Matthew chapter 3, starting with verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So he's preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. A line I didn't include on the slides, it's in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 3, but I love this line, John the Baptist told the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Isn't that a great line? Another translation, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What does that mean? If you say you've repented, if you say you've asked for forgiveness, repentance is not just asking for forgiveness. Repentance is you were going this way and now you're going this way. So he says, bear fruit, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What does that mean? When people see you, imagine you're a tree, they see good fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and, and, and souls being saved, right? That's good fruit. So if you say that you're a follower of Jesus, if you say that you've been forgiven, if you say that you're living for God, then produce fruit that lines up with that, right? So, in other words, don't just talk the talk, but also walk the walk, amen? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So, John the Baptist, we know he was called, and now we can see number two, he preached or he proclaimed. Number one, he was called. Number two, he went around preaching and teaching and proclaiming, making the way for the Lord. Matthew 3, 4. This is just a kind of a description of, of John the Baptist. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. <laughs> Anybody ever have that one weird friend? Anybody? Maybe, maybe you are the weird friend. I, I don't know. Like maybe they, maybe they, 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 they vow never to wear shoes again. They just walk around barefoot or something. Or maybe they, they like eating insects and honey. I don't know. Everyone's got that one friend. Again, if, if you don't have that, then you probably are that one friend. It's, it's very possible. But John the Baptist, he was a little different. Matter of fact, if you watch The Chosen, at least one of the characters refers to John as Crazy John. I don't think that's very polite. Uh, he was just different. You know what I'm saying? He was, he, was, he was a little different. That boy's different. Okay, so, but it's interesting that he wore camel's hair and a leather belt. Again, I don't have a slide for this, Daryl, but in 2 Kings 1.8, it says uh, that Elijah had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. So there's some similarities between John the Baptist and Elijah. And what's interesting is, if you think about it, there's a, a period of time called the intertestamental period between the Old Testament, Malachi, and the New Testament, 
you know, Matthew. And there's, it's known as the, a time of silence where God, there's no revelation from God. And other than the angels, John the Baptist is, the, is, is one of the first to proclaim the words of God. Just like one of the old prophets of the Old Testament. Very transitionary. He's like a transitionary prophet from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So, Matthew 3, verse 5. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So number one, he was called. Number two, he preached. And number three, he baptized. Very important. And of course, we know that John the Baptist actually baptized Jesus. But let's look at John chapter 1, verse 35, another description or aspect of John the Baptist. And again, this is not going to be an exhaustive look at John the Baptist. We're just highlighting uh, some things about his life here. But in John chapter 1, verse 35, it says this, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God! When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. It's interesting, John the Baptist had his own disciples. And this is an interesting occurrence because he points to Jesus and says, look, look, the Lamb of God. And two of his disciples leave him and go start following Jesus, one of which was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. But he's still pointing people to Jesus. You see how it is? He has his own disciples, but he's still pointing people to Jesus. So number one, he was called. Number two, he preached. Number three, he baptized. And number four, he had disciples. He had his own disciples. But again, Luke 117 says to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was leading people to Jesus. Now, he could have thought that he was all that. He could have thought he was all that in a bag of chips. You know what I'm saying? He could have thought that, look at me. I'm called. I'm preaching. I'm special. Jesus says I'm great. I'm baptizing people. I got my own posse. I got my own disciples. I'm pretty, I'm, you know what I'm saying? How easy it is for people to think they're all that. What's interesting about these four things, what does that look like? What does that remind you of? Anybody? It looks like the Great Commission, doesn't it? Isn't it amazing that John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus and he was already fulfilling the Great Commission? Look at this in Matthew 28, 18. uh, It says, Then Jesus came to them, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Then, of course, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's look at this, this comparison here, if you will. John the Baptist and disciples of Jesus. This is amazing. Like, he was called... The Great Commission says, therefore, go, so disciples are called as well. Amen? John the Baptist preached. Well, the Great Commission tells us to teach, and so disciples preach and teach. Just like John the Baptist baptized, well, we are called to baptize people. Disciples of Jesus baptize, and he had disciples. We are called to make disciples. Again, disciples making disciples. So like I said earlier, John the Baptist, think about it. This is John the Baptist, called by God, anointed by God, filled with the Holy Spirit before he was even born. Amazing, and he really could have got a big head about him. I don't care if you're a, a, for example, I just use this as an example, I don't care if you're a pastor of 50 or a pastor of 500 or a pastor of 5,000, it could be really easy for people to think, these are my people. Look at me, man. Look at me. You know, some of those, and I, I'm not dissing on mega preachers at all. We came from a mega church. Uh, there's, there's a place for mega churches, and there's a place for small churches. But the bigger the church and the bigger the following, it'd be really, I bet the number one challenge for big church pastors would be thinking they're all that. 
That would be a huge challenge because those are their disciples, but they're Jesus' disciples. Amen? And it's really hard for all of us. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. Like, my wife and I talk about this all the time. Let's scale it, scale it down just to you and I then. You know, you go and you do something nice for somebody. Or God tells you, hey, go tell somebody about Jesus. Or you do something in ministry and something good comes out of it. It's really hard not to get puffed up. I think it was Paul that wrote in the New Testament, whenever I try to do good, evil is right there with me. It's so difficult to do good and, 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 and not, not start thinking that it's because of you. Again, we must decrease and he must increase. And John the Baptist, somehow he just knew, I need to point people to Jesus. I need to point people to Jesus. Yeah, God has blessed me. Yeah, I am anointed, but I need to point people to Jesus. In John 1.20, it says this, or it says, John the Baptist did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Messiah. You guys got it wrong if you think I'm the Messiah. You guys got it wrong if you think I'm the Savior. I am merely a servant just like everybody else, and I'm pointing the way to Jesus. And you've heard me say this before. Again, I, I mentioned it earlier about the testimony. Your testimony is super powerful. Why? Because it points people to Jesus. We should never be like walking around holier than thou saying, hey, look at me, look at me, I'm a Christian, look at me. This is how I've always been. I came out this way. No, you are where you're at because of him. If there is any good in your life, if there's any deliverance in your life, if there's, if there's any healing in your, in your life, if there's any holiness, any righteousness, it's all because of him. And John the Baptist said, I am not the Messiah, verse 23, John replied to the, uh, uh, he replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Again, he was the guy to, to get the people ready for Jesus. And by the time Jesus came on the scene, they're already ready. They're primed and ready because of the ministry of John the Baptist. But he pointed people to Jesus. Verse 26, he says, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one that comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Wow, what a description. You know, back then they, they, they'd wear sandals and they'd walk around on dirt roads and their, their feet would be all dirty. And John's saying, I don't, I'm not even worthy to, to stoop down and untie his sandals. That's how far above he is than I am. I want, to God, I want to set you guys straight. I want to set you straight. Listen, I'm doing great things for the Lord. This is what John is saying. I'm doing great things for the Lord, but listen, <laughs> I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I mean, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. So here it is. This is where we get the title from today, John 3.30. John the Baptist said this. He says, I must increase... I'm sorry. I knew I was going to mess that up. See? The self always wants to get in there, doesn't it? He must increase, but I must decrease. The NIV says, he must become greater, I must become less. And I love what the message says. Just, just give me a moment to share the, what the message says here. It says, this is the assigned moment for him to move into the center while I slip off into the sidelines. Isn't that beautiful? This is the moment in time where he comes into the center and I slip off into the sidelines or off into the background. This may be a time in your life for that. Perhaps you've been sitting on the throne of your life for too long. You may be a Christian, you may be a follower of Jesus, but you guys have been playing musical chairs with the throne of your heart. He must increase. He must increase. I, I just want to read this again. This is the assigned moment for him to move into the center while I slip off to the sidelines. Have you guys ever seen this, this logo, the H-E Thing with the eye. Have you guys ever seen this? This this kid. I I didn't. I don't know if I realized this, and maybe this is where I first saw it. It came out of Hawaii. It's a a company out of Hawaii. They started small and they're starting to grow. Does anybody know what it stands for? 
Anybody? Yes. And more simplified, I love that. More simplified, he is greater than I. He is greater than I. I, I, I got to get a sticker, babe. I'm going to order a sticker, maybe a T-shirt. I love this logo. He is greater than I. And you know, in the English language, the, the I is always capitalized, isn't it? And I love in this particular situation, it's lowercase. He is greater than I. And then I don't know if you've ever saw this before on, uh, on YouTube. There's a YouTube channel called I Am Second. I Am Second. Anyone ever seen it? I Am Second? Semi-famous Christians. <laughs> I say semi-famous because they're, they're, they're celebrities in their own right. Uh, they, they give their testimony. I, I want to encourage you to go to I Am Second. It's really a great channel on YouTube. But they give, I think Lecrae's on there and the, the little girl from Bridge to Terabithia. Anyway, there's different celebrities that are on there and they give their testimony. And every single testimony ends with, my name is blah, 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 and I Am Second. In other words, he must increase and I must decrease. Luke 117, the angel also said about John that he would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And that is what we're called to do. Listen, I don't know if you guys are aware, but Christmas is controversial in the Christian world. I'm not sure why that is. It just is. Some churches don't celebrate it at all. Some, some people are against Christmas trees and, and stuff like that. But I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. This is a golden opportunity for us Christians around the Christmas time. You can walk into Walmart and hear the gospel being declared in music in the speakers. You got people saying Merry Christmas. I know there's a lot of places that don't say Merry Christmas. They say Happy Holidays, but you could drive around the neighborhood. You see nativity scenes. This is a golden opportunity as Christians to be able to share the gospel with people that maybe are confused for why we celebrate or why this is all happening. But this is an opportunity for us to be able to Share Jesus with other people because Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen? So we need to make ready a people, prepare for the Lord. And, and I'm just going to refer to our disciples of Jesus making disciples logo. That's what we're all about. We are disciples of Jesus. We're not disciples of Chris. We're not disciples of Jamie. We're not even necessarily disciples of real life church. We are disciples of Jesus we, we point people to Jesus. We, we remind ourselves that he's the reason that we're here. He's the reason why we do this. It doesn't matter. Again, you could be a, a hugely successful in your, in, your, in your vocation. You could be hugely successful in your business or in ministry or whatever the case may be. But no matter how big you get or how great you are, you must decrease and he must increase in your life. Amen? John 3.30 again. He must increase but I must decrease. And that's where we get the title for today, He Must Increase. And I kind of stole their, a little bit of their, that He is greater than I logo, with the greater sign, He must increase. And there's us on the other side. So why, why do we worship Him? Why is He our focus, and our attention. So in closing, I just want to do a quick little review of where we've gone the last few weeks. We start off with the Lord is my shepherd and that we are his sheep and he guides us and leads us and he protects us. And even uh, the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 2 they refer to the prophecy in Micah about how the baby would be born, the, the, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and it says that he will shepherd his people. And in the following week, we talked about the Lord is my light. And John refers, uh, John, the, the gospel of John refers to uh, the light of the world coming into the, or the light coming into the world. And Jesus himself says, I am the light of the world. 
He is our salvation. He is our shepherd and our salvation and our stronghold. And he is our our light. And then the following week, we saw that the Lord hears. And we just saw in the story of John the Baptist that the Lord heard their prayers and granted them a son in their old age. And he grew up and prepared a way for the Lord. And then the following week, we talked about how God is love. I mean, that should be the strongest message you hear in the Christmas season, that God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And he was born in the the most interesting circumstances. There wasn't even room for him in the inn. They had to go to where the animals were, and they laid him in a manger instead of a crib. But the Lord gave us his son. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong. He never went against the Father once. And later on, of course, we know that he died for our sins, and we celebrated that in communion. Last week, we saw how Jesus is the branch of hope. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I believe there's a lot of people in this room and also out there in our community that need hope. But unfortunately, we put our hope in the wrong kind of stuff sometimes. We need to point people to Jesus and say, I'm this way because I hope in Jesus. I worship him. I decrease and he increases. And that could be applied to any area of our life. If you need a healing, decrease and allow him to increase in your life. You need deliverance, decrease and allow him to increase in your life. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message, Lord. It is hard. We like the throne. We like to be in charge. We like to have control. And it makes us nervous to give you complete control, to give you complete lordship, because, well, sometimes we lack faith and sometimes we lack trust. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, we, our hearts get depleted. Maybe we forget how much you love us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. I just pray, God, that you would empower us. You would empower us to uh, allow you to truly come into our hearts, allow you to truly sit on the throne of our lives, allow you to be Lord of our lives, allow you to be King, that we would decrease and you would increase. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. You may have heard that our church is in a season of waiting. Sometimes waiting can feel awkward. But in this moment, I want us to just wait on him. What is he saying to you in this moment? We're also in a season of hearing his voice, listening for his voice. Is there anyone who has something on their heart 
that they believe is from God that they're supposed to share with the congregation. Word of knowledge or don't make it happen if it's not from God, but if you feel like God is prompting you to, to share something with the congregation, an encouragement or a, even an admonition, Perhaps, Lord, what you have spoken has already been said. Perhaps you have things for us as individuals. As we go this week, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us, compel us to stop in our busy day and listen and wait upon you and have you renew our strength and fill us with your love, O oh God. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. Yes, yeah. We're going to do some announcements. You guys ready for that? Should we do it with music? <laughs> All right, so this is going to be a, a, a workshop of sorts. Yes. We want to. We want to. We want you guys to get out your phones. Get out your phones. So, I, I know you guys are. Some of you are addicted to your phones. Some of you maybe not so much. But go ahead, get your phones out. Get ready. This and then light them up. And then like, Ooh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We got to get you guys on the website. Gina does such a great job putting the website together. Yes. And, and uh, we want to, I know the kids are sick today, I think, but we definitely want you guys to be on there and sharing and, and knowing how to use it. Okay. I don't like technology, but it's just the way we're going. Okay. Mm. So I had to get used to it. So you need to go to the website to register for, for this Wednesday, which we're having food, we're having fun, party games, prizes. Dress like the, your favorite Christmas song. Win a prize. And last year was really awesome. We had a lot of close winners. So this year is dress as your favorite Christmas song or Christmas carol. Dinner provided with RSVP. So if you want food, get out your phone and go to, ready? R-L-C. Fortmill.com. Dot com. R-O-C, fortmail.com. And you'll just scroll and you'll see this beautiful picture Gina put up there. You just click on and it just says RSV, put, right? RSVP. Something. RSV, that's <laughs> a... Don't get RSV. That's a breathing. We're, yeah, thing. not that. No, Daniel has that. That was sad. <laughs> yeah. No. Nope. No, if no, you've already, already done it, don't do it again. But just know our website. Make sure you keep up to date on all the things that we're doing. You can see a calendar there. You can see all of the activities. And I just want you guys to get more acquainted with that. We also have a Facebook page and Instagram real yes. life page. Make sure you're following us. So, yes. so the way that Facebook works yes. is that when people like things and people share things, and people comment on things, and it gets more traction, which is uh, gives the church more traction, which will, will draw people in. Huh? Yes, huh? yes. That's and how then great. YouTube uh, is where we put the, the services, the sermons and stuff. So go on YouTube, subscribe, but you have to listen. Lean in and listen. Okay, so on YouTube, you have to subscribe, uh, but you have to also say you want notifications so that whenever a, a video is posted, it'll notify you. Here's the thing. Uh, I want you guys to try, to try to get in the habit of sharing things with people because yes. the more you share things with people, the more right. uh, visibility Real Life Church will have. Amen? So there, you can share the Christmas party with them this Wednesday at 6.30. You can share Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is Sunday at 10.30. So next week, Sunday at 10.30, there's an interactive service. Wow, so that's coming up fast. Family, yeah, next week. <laughs> family and we're going to have bags for the kids. We're going to have a story for the kids. We're yes. going to have activities for 
everybody, teens, adults, it's going to be interactive and fun, and we get to see us be goofy up here and do funny things, so you don't want to miss that. You want to invite your family. I'm never goofy. Never. And you want to have, invite your family, your friends, your neighbors, because there's a salvation message of hope and healing, and we all need hope and healing. Amen. And candles. And candles. We get to sing Christmas carols with candles. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, don't do that. And then we get to do amazing things. And excelsis. No, stop it. Day. Don't sing that one. I don't like that one. You don't like that one? <laughs> it's a good one, but I, I prefer Silent There's Night. There's always a hater, right? There's, There's always, always a hater. I'm a hater of Christmas carols, <laughs> but I love Silent Night. We're doing that. So. Silent <laughs> Okay, night. so that's next week. All right, what else am I forgetting? Is that uh, it? Christmas party this Wednesday at... 6.30, make sure you go online, get cheers so you can get food. And the Christmas um, Eve service is at Christmas uh, Eve service is 10.30 next Sunday. All right, and then giving, uh, yes. you guys know the drill. You can give in the black box back there, or you can give online, which is super, super user-friendly. You can take a picture of that QR code if you know what that is. <laughs> Lord, thank you so yes. much. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the generosity of this church. Thank you for those who give through this church, oh God. I just pray that you would multiply it, multiply it, multiply it, God. As you did the loaves and fishes, God, I pray that you would multiply the offerings and the tithes that come in here, oh God, for your glory, God. We are here for your glory. We are here to bring you glory. Help us to glorify you and all that we do. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. all right, go love on each other, you know, say hello, be nice, and uh, have a great Sunday.